to the old Spanish Trail. The Pioneer Trail goes through Paraguda, Parowan, to Enoch, and then on out to Mountain Meadow. So we're just a little bit off the side of it. When they came in, there was a detachment of called Dragoons. And when the Dragoons were issued out of Salt Lake under authority of the federal government, they came down through here and left the camp marks, if you will, here in the gap as they continued on a shortcut to get over to Mountain Meadows. If you want to see the evidence of that, when you go through the gap, there's a big wall on the south side, north facing, that has like a skull and it has a cross and a couple of initials inside of a box. Well, that skull was the emblem, the emblem on the flag of the Dragoons. And that was where they camped. And while they were camped there, they recorded their presence. And that is the militia that made those petroglyphic marks down there. They're not gra graffiti. So that's the next point at which we understand that there were people that were involved out here and knew what was going on. About the next time a thing that comes around is in the 1830s, they were looking for a shorter, easier route to get to Lund, Utah. The railroad came in at about 1819, or 1919, and they started talking about it prior to then. Brigham Young decided they had to have a railway down through here, and the rest of that's not part of this history. The history here is that from Perwin to get to the trail, uh, the railhead at Lund is a long ways if you have to go all the way down through Cedar and out through uh, what they call the Mud Gap. You don't want to do that. It's easier to hit the mud gap by coming through here. And so they pushed back the rocks in this area and this became the primary freight route. And from then on, people passed through here and, and noticed the petroglyphs and just as the same as others, they said, yeah, here they are. There wasn't much done to protect them. The county probably at that time did the most damage of anything that has been done because when they pushed the road through, they blasted all of the rocks out. And as they blasted those rocks, they pushed the burden to the west side. And if you go down to the west side of the gap, you'll see there's another big pile of rocks with another interpretive sign. Well, those petroglyphs are all underneath the rocks because that's where they pushed all of the burden. There's only one panel there that still remains today. In about 1945, when the old Spanish and National Historic Trail started to take an interest in this area, Alva Mathis and my father and a group of others with the Sons of Utah Pioneers did their best to try and preserve what was here. And that was a labor of love for a good many years. It was clear until the 1980s, 1990s, before they were able to get the protection that you see on the plaque and the fencing and get some money and I was the director of the Old Spanish Trail for the state of Utah, finally convinced and worked with Nancy Dalton and some other people in this area to create a historic spot that's on BLM property. And so the BLM is responsible for all of these nice additions and, and the improvements that we have. There's another thing that happened, and that is a couple of friends, Garth Norman and um, some of the people that have been working on this for a good long while, started advertising and working with this thing with the idea that this was a celestially oriented interactive site. And that may well be. Um, that, uh, some of that is left up to discussion, but all of it is something that could have happened and we're still in the process of trying to figure it out. The facts that we know is that these petroglyphs, and there are pictographs, are essentially not local. They're not Paiute, they're not Pai, they're not Shinawa, they're not any of the Shivwits. These petroglyphs were put in here by a prior people. The Parowan Valley was populated by a group called the Mound Builders. They had a very close association with the Fremont Indians, who were the ones up at the Fremont National Park and in the Long Valley. And so all of this distance as you go from here all the way through is basically a series of travel corridors. Each one of them have left a series of petroglyphs or pictographs. The difference in that is that these are petroglyphs. You take a rock and
and you inscribe it. The way these are made is not haphazard. If you ever try to do this sometime, you'll recognize that if you take a rock and pound, you can't do much at all. This is all what is called secondary percussion. And the percussion is that you take a good, sharp, hard rock, generally an agate or maybe even a, a, a quartzite, and you take one with a point and you put it where you want and then you hit it and then you spall off the, the rock in order to make it so you can just sit there and continue to pound. It is not easy. If you want to try this sometime a year, get a piece of cement and try and carve a petroglyph into it. It takes a lot of time. You will also find that predominantly all of these petroglyphs are found, notice, on southwest facing. It's almost almost never that you will find a rock that is not open to the southeast about 120 degrees plus or minus 10 degrees and the theory behind that is that during the summer everyone was so involved in in uh, food pr production and hunting that the only time they had was during the winter and they would go find the warmest rock around and they had the time and that's where you normally find this stuff now the gap is a little bit different because there are places that are spiritual in orientation where they use them on a repetitive basis and so the sun wasn't as much of a factor. The reason for the gap being here is multi multitudinous, I guess, but the first one is that they had a very close affiliation with Mother Earth. The second is that if you go down the road here just about 100 yards and look back up here in the sidewall, you'll see a perfect profile of what they believe to be the Indian god Tobats. And Tobats is the guardian of this place. Now that's a Paiute approach. That's a recent, more recent Indian. Whether the uh, Native Americans prior to that ever saw Tobats or not is probably a little bit of conjecture. But at the same time, this became a very sacred spot for everybody using it. Um, Nell Morris and Garth Norman are probably the two. Nell is a, an individual who determined that by looking at this thing, he saw a relationship to the navigational systems of the, the sky. And so he put these by retrograde back into a computer and found that there are ley lines that work back and forth through the gap. And if you go up here on the hills or places where there could have been cairns, there may have been cairns. The problem that I have with some of that is that many of the places where he now finds cairns to mark these locations are places that have been disrupted by the road crews and so they have to be recent or have to be someone else. The other thing that you may find that is interesting is that most of these things are very high. The petroglyphs that you really want to see are not the ones you're looking at. These are predominantly the ones that are used for the interpretation of what is called the metonic cycle of the moon, the 19-year cycle, the birth cycle. If you look at it, you can conceive that this was a womb. You can conceive of it as being, um, you know, anything you want. Most of the people arrive at the idea that this is, in fact, a calendaring kind of thing. And from this, they can predict or determine the times and the seasons. Well, those are usually done by a different uh, means. The, uh, I'll, I'll come back to that, I think. So right now, as you look up, you'll see that there are different uh, epics and there are different categories. You look to the left, for instance, up here, you'll see two bear's feet with a snake at the side. Mm -hmm. Can you notice that that's significantly newer than the ones adjacent to it? If you look around the side here, you'll see on the the southwest facing, can you see that design? It looks like hands interlocking. Mm -hmm. That's very typically Samoan or even South American. Garth would say that this is the influence of the middle American cultures coming through, and that's why that one is there. There's no evidence that it's an Indian sign. If you come back around, you also see the one that has the bullet holes up there that is fairly old. We find that a lot in New Mexico and places where they have sun symbols and they have a way of using that round thing and then they mark times and seasons around it. Not necessarily seasons for coming and going, but most of it is for the seasons of something happening. 
So if they came through a different time or a different day to different people, we find those and actually call them they're like a, a ticket or like a, a, a marker panel. As you move on back, one of the more interesting ones is you see the man with the two lines through his arms. That's almost precisely the same thing that you will find in Arizona associated with most of the Sinawan, which means people without water. You see that their culture has that. And then next to it, you see that downward thing that looks like a, a spaceship landing, people call it. Well, that would be nice, except there are so many of them around that that one we find in the Fremont culture. There are at least three of them up in the Fremont Canyon. They're almost identical and a couple to the south. As you move on back, if these were scenario, you see up there in the top that there's a guy with a kind of a pointy head? Yeah. That doesn't fit in with any of the other cultures. That is, uh, Fremont is essentially a squared head with a triangle. The same thing with the barrier people, the same thing with what's called the cave style. So that one is most likely to be a very old one, and that's up where the chicken uh, feet are, they call it. Uh, where you move across that, you can see that that one is a completely different style than any of the others that are put in there. Then you come back down, the most curious of all is you see the one that has the orbs up there is very distinctly Fremont. So once again, you have a different group. Uh, I guess the point of this is that there are a lot of people making the marks up here. If we had an opportunity, and I don't know, I'll just give you the words. As you walk down through here, you need to be particularly mindful of a couple of things to look for. On the, the uh, side, as you go down, there's a very large rock that most people just pass by. If you look in the center of that rock, you'll see a turtle back very cleanly. That is presumed to be a clan symbol for a family that came back very regularly. If you go on down further, when you come to the rocks that have the glyphs on that I mentioned were put there by the militia, if you look to the right and go up at an angle, you'll see a mule, pregnant mule, that is the most perfect little guy you ever saw in your life, if you look for it. That one obviously comes from some time after the old Spanish trail in there because it's not a deer or something else, it's a mule. When you come back to the other side, you need to look back up at an angle into these other rocks and you'll find a plethora of additional markings. And most of those are diagrammatic. They look like signs and symbols, not like their communication. Another thing that I'd suggest in the interest of your time is you go clear through to the end where the little uh, interpretive panel is. If you come back about 50 yards, and most people look at eye level. In this case, you need to look up at about a 60 degree angle and you'll see that there are more geometric figures on the top and you'll see one of these tally glyphs up there as well. Where's that or south side? It's on the south, or on the south facing north side. Um, one the other turtle, last couple the of comments. one is on that side of the road? The, the turtle? The, the turtle is on the south facing side. It's on your right, on the right as you go. Another thing that you probably want to know, especially those who are interested in rock art, is that this is not where the glyphs are. The good stuff is not here. Um, one of the things that is predominant here is that people have interpreted this, discussed it, they put it into local culture. Uh, we have a, a a solstice and we have an equinox and we have people come around and everybody talks about it. But to be a sidereal glyph, you have to have a gnomon. A gnomon is something that controls all of the views and the angles. Well, there isn't one here, but yes, there is. It just happens to be a different place. People haven't discovered it. When they do, there will be a new history written for this place. And I'm not going to tell them where it is. The other one is that, uh, as you go out of here, when you come to the point at the end of the road where you can now see the Little Salt Lake, the playa out there, stop. You may see a little bit of a place to the right. If you pull off to the right there by one of the reflective signs, and you may have to walk, walk directly across to the south facing ledges, and you'll see uh, up there, there's a sun symbol that's nearly three feet in diameter 
There are several life-sized anamorphs in there. There are a number of, uh, there, there's just a whole story of things going on. Between here and there in that next mile, there are at least three Spanish crosses that have been put in there. This the land, this area, for those prior years after about 1668, it was very populated with, uh, or prior to that, was populated by the Spanish culture. The other problem that I, and I don't want to say a problem, people keep looking at these and making an interpretation, but what they don't do is look for other corroborating pieces of interest. There's a place directly to the south here called Wind Canyon. And Wind Canyon has some of the most beautiful uh, interpretive, interactive sun symbols you've ever seen. And they are very distinctly calendar in oriented. So one of these times, uh, whether it's uh, now or Garth or one of the others, we'll kind of take this thing in context and say, well, wait a second, we're not just this own little place. Let's look around and when they expend their minds, they're going to find a whole lot of stuff that they've been missing. Do any of you have any questions or anything that I can help with? You've really been great. Did we ever hire you for a personal show? <laughs> Only for nothing. I love it. I would rather do this than about anything. You can join that protection organization. That would be. What's also interested is when you, one of the things that I can kind of bring to the game, and that is that I'm a master navigator. So when these people talk about astrological and those kind of things, you have to follow with me they don't understand what they're talking not because they don't have the intellect but they don't have the background to understand the difference in angles and azimuth and heights observed and HOs and all the other kind of things because if you were to give me a, a staff let's say a broomstick and put it right here in this concrete and a black pen I can do everything that is done here with nothing more than that so if I can do it, and I'm just an observer, and if the local indigenous people are observers and look at it once and then come back a year from now, you know, you get a pattern, and then a person's lifetime, you say, wait a second, it's almost springtime. Wait a second, it's being winter. Why? Because they've seen it happen. You don't need a rock to tell you that, and having a rock doesn't make it any easier or any better. So it's, it's a lot, sir. The uh, the large largest symbol there was it looks like antennae going uh -huh. up. Yeah. How do you interpret that? Are you really asking me yes. that? Uh, <laughs> do you really want to know the answer? I do. All right. Now oh, I'm going to swear everybody to absolute silence. <laughs> I do not want anybody. And since I don't recognize many of you, I can get by with this. I do have an answer, and it's not the one that people are telling you. The one that you're going to hear is that it says either a womb or it is a, a journey in time, forward and back. There are a lot of those other things. My answer is, within a few miles to the south of here, and maybe you'd like to do this, I can take you to a location where there are at least eight of those carved into the rocks. Really? Each one in a different direction, each one at a different location, each one with a different symbol, and they are characteristically identical to this, with the exception they don't have all of the little feathers. Oh. Now, how do you think the Indians acquired their game? They didn't get out here and chase them around like they're rabbits. Oh. What they did was they took two fences, either natural or unnatural that they built, and they channeled them into a narrow neck that they could control, oh. and then they had an opening on the other side called a game trap. Okay, so the Indians were relatively proficient at using those game traps and each time they would hunt they would make one of these traps and they would put branches on whatever it took and then beat the brush until the game moved into it now they had them cornered then they had a better chance of making it. the only thing that i'd suggest differently is that i believe that